what's, what's pantheism? Worshipping everything. Yeah, that's true. What else is involved here? What does pantheism mean? Worshipping the creation instead of the creator. All right. And the reason is why. Because you just take a look here. Pan means what? All. Yeah, many. All. Pantheism means all is God. That's what pantheism literally means. All is God. So pantheism, which is a standard feature of a lot of Eastern religions, would say that tree is God, the little bunny is God, the hurricane is God, the thunderstorm is God, the water bottle is God, God is all, all is God, and that's pantheism. All is one, one is all, and you get kind of a corollary of pantheism is this idea of monism. This goes with this. You run across this word as well. Monism means one, all is one. Standard feature of Hindu thought, a lot of Eastern thought in India. You run across in India, this, this in India. And you run across it in um, enlightened Western thinkers. All is one. You know, you, in fact, you can read it on the side of the um, Hard Rock Cafe, right? Love all, serve all, all is one. Something like that. You know? That's the, the mantra, the, the motto of the Hard Rock Cafe. So all is one. And it's a rather attractive thought. We're all one. Everything is God, and we're all in this together. Now, pantheism's big problem is what? Why is this a big an issue? What's wrong with this? Idolatry. Why is idolatry? Yeah, because now we're worshiping the tree like it's God, and we're worshiping the wheat field like it's God. That's a big problem. What else is wrong with this? It doesn't separate creator from creation. Right. There is no distinction made between the creator and his creation, and we're running them together. And so we're treating God like he's just part of the creation, or we're treating the creation like it's part of God, and we're not making the distinction. That's a big problem. And that's undermining all that we confess as Christians. All right. Another problem, another doctrine that runs against the doctrine of creation is deism. Deism. Let's make sure we understand what deism is. And Kolb has a good discussion of this. What do you know about deism? So like the clockmaker theory? Yeah, go ahead. God created the world with his own me mechanisms and rules, and it runs on its own without Yeah, his own and now he stands back and stays out of it. That's deism. So deism teaches that God created it, God made it, and now he stands back. So deism would say, God created the world, wound it up, got it going, built all the laws and all the rules into it, and now he just stands back and the way it goes, and he no longer intervenes. Deism would disagree with the teaching of miracles. In deism, there are no miracles. So miracles are out. Why? That means he's intervening. Yeah, he's, he's messing around, he's intervening. God doesn't do that. He doesn't do miracles. So a true deist would not look for miracles. Now, does a deist believe God's there? Sure. And does a deist believe that God has established morality? Yes. It's very convenient. But does a deist believe that God is involved in any way? No. So man becomes very much self-dependent, and man has to make his own reality, and man has to try to press his own way forward, and he becomes very self-reliant. That's what deism is all about. What's that? Savior. Yeah, you become your own savior. You don't need God intervening. Now, why is deism relevant? You don't need deists. Pantheists, well, let's back up to pantheists. So I told you that we have Hinduism, our pantheist. Are pantheism relevant for any other reason? Go ahead. They're worshiping crystals and all kinds of weird stuff. All right. The New Age movement is nothing more than um, rehashed. Eastern theology and Eastern philosophy. That's all it is. And that's very prevalent. So New Age thinking is clearly very pantheistic. And that's coming into the United States? You bet it is. Absolutely. And you need to have the eyes to recognize it, that the pantheistic ideas are quite prevalent in the United States now, that God is in everything, all is God. We're all participating in the reality that is God. And the reality of God is just this kind of um, life force that's, that's very typical of pantheistic ideas. All right, what about deism? 
that relevant to us? No need deists? I think this could be interpreted as kind of the natural way society thinks. Because you ask most people, yeah, there's a God, but mm -hmm. they don't really believe that he does anything. There's a God. Very people good. believe in a God. Very good. So there's a God, but he has very little relevance for my life. All right? <clears throat> so actually, this is pretty common in our society. Okay? Other thoughts? You start thinking about separation of church and state mm -hmm. and the way society should run. Society runs on its own without any interference by God. All right, and it's interesting you bring up separation of church and state because who was the one who espoused that and taught that? Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. And Jefferson is the quintessential deist. In fact, most of the founding fathers of our country were deists. So were they God fearing? Sure. Were they Christian? Not a chance. Yeah. So what you hear referred to as agnostics, they believe in a higher power. Yeah, agnostic, not really. Just by definition, let's make sure we cover all of our definitions since we're doing that kind of stuff here. <coughs> Oops. Okay, an atheist believes what? There is no God. All right, there is no God. You have the alpha, called the alpha primitive, stuck on front. We have the word theos, the theist, the theist believes in God, coming from the Greek word theos, God. And you put the alpha privative on any word, and it negates it. So an atheist says there is no God. Okay? So no God. That's an atheist. And agnostic, whoops. And agnostic believes what? You can't know. Don't know. That's an agnostic. And you can see it right here. You have the alpha privative again. Gnosis means knowledge. The alpha privative, don't know. Agnostic. So an atheist says there is no God flat out. An agnostic says maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Don't really know. And by the way, which of these is more prevalent in our culture? Agnostics. Agnostics. A true atheist is a rare bird. Very rare. Because to be able to just stay flat out, there is no God. You're arguing there is no God, and I can prove there is no God. And they have just as much problem doing that as we do proving there is one. So there is no, a true atheist is pretty rare. In fact, some people have said there is no such thing as a true atheist. Everybody has some kind of God. Um, what I've heard people say before is sort of like a cross between agnosticism and deism, mm -hmm. where it's like, don't know if there's a God or not, don't think it really matters, guess I'll find out someday. Yeah, you'll get that. Now, and I agree with that. Does, is an agnostic the same as a deist? I don't think so. A real deist would say there's absolutely a God, and I'm sure there is, because the cosmological argument, the teleological argument, they knew those things. Yeah, there's a God. But is that God actively involved in the affairs of this world and saving me? <laughs> no. I'm, he expects me to save myself and to take care of myself and to do my own thing. So, a deist is not an agnostic. But today in our culture, you get these kind of strange blends. Deism, very popular idea. But also the idea of um, not really being real sure, X there. And you also have a whole lot of the voluntarism, my free will, my choice, my responsibility, that's coming through. So you get all, all kinds of strange mixtures in our culture today, all kind of running at once. I think deism is very relevant for us because we need to realize that Deism was the, um, the foundation for most of our, our country's op operation. And you, are, you still encounter, usually from more, you know, I suppose, ultra-conservative bunches or fundamentalist bunches, this idea that America is a Christian nation founded on Christian principles and we need to get back to our godly heritage. And you hear this a lot, you know, our godly heritage. We need to reclaim our godly heritage. And the fact of the matter is we don't really have a godly heritage. We have a moral heritage. And we have, uh, I suppose, a righteous heritage. It's a very, it was steeped in um, modernism and in what we, I would call the Enlightenment, which was what brought the modernism to the <laughs> forefront. And it's just filled with that stuff. Our country is filled with that. Read the Declaration of Independence, and it just rolls out of it. Declaration of Independence is not a Christian bit in the whole thing. Lots of Enlightenment, lots of deistic ideas. I know we believe that all men are created by their 
by God with certain inalienable rights, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. Or that's not Christian. That's enlightenment. So, God, sure. Relevant for this life? Yeah, he sets some rules. We need to be moral, but it's ultimately our choice to make our reality and we press forward. And the deistic ideas are still quite prevalent in our society, all around us. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Deistic view of salvation to them? Salvation kind of it really becomes a works righteous sort of a thing. Because salvation means cooperating with what's moral and doing things the way that God would have you do them. And if you do that, then you're you get to be saved, whatever you might believe in. You know, they're pretty vague on the afterlife. Um, Jefferson probably believed in an afterlife. He thought it important to have some kind of afterlife to be able to take care of justice issues and you know, pay it back, people who get away with stuff in this life. And that's one of the reasons why you need to have an afterlife, just to settle the score, in a sense, and hold you ac people accountable. So he had that need for it. But salvation, probably for Jefferson, really, salvation had more to do with um, making the world all that we can make it and making the world a better place, which is still pretty much how most well, probably most Americans define salvation today. What are we here to do? Make the world a better place than it was. You know, we're working for a better future, a better tomorrow, and that's our goal. And salvation will be when we have a um, self-sustaining world that can, you know, it's not going to burn up in the, you know, global warming, and it's not going to, um, you know, use up all the fossil fuels, and we're not going to kill each other with nukes, and we're all going to get along, and we're all going to be living the Star Trek reality forever. That's kind of the goal. Yeah. Okay. So it's basically when life is over, when life is over. That's it. Yeah. We're done. Yeah. You do your bit. You have your part. Make the most of it. Contribute. You live on your memories. Yada yada yada. All the funeral home trite. Yeah. I'm not here. I'm in the sun. In the moon. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. Right. Okay. So deism really flies in the face of the idea of creation. Because, and what's wrong with theism? Why would we argue against it? Because he's still active. Yeah, God's very active in his creation. He doesn't do it once and then stand back. In fact, creation continues. It's ongoing. Every time a child is conceived, creation has happened again. Every time that the world is preserved through tribulation and through you know tri trials or storms, it's God's active creation. And... We call that providence. The doctrine of providence. Providence looks just like it says, provide. God provides. He cares for it. He's looking after it. So this is part of the work of God the Father, the ongoing care for the creation. He creates it. He cares for it. He provides for it. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not a want, wash your hands and stand back. Ongoing Caring for the creation. All right. So providence is a good thing. All right. Next one that Cole picks on as an attack against the first article is the doctrine or the teaching of dualism. Dualism is the teaching that there is a perpetual battle going on within the universe between the forces of good and the forces of evil. And they're a pitched battle back and forth between the two of them. Classically, in the ancient world, there was a group known as Manichaeanism. And Manichaeanism was a dualism. You might hear about a Manichaean idea. Luther talks it that way a lot of times. So you should be familiar with that. So if you see Manichaean, that just means dualism, a dualistic idea. So dualism is the idea of good and evil always fighting back and forth with each other. And it's symbolized in a rather popular symbol. You see this now you know, quite a bit. Okay, you guys seen that one? What's that called? Yeah, very really good, yin and yang. And you'll see little junior high girls wearing it because it's cool. You know, along with their peace sign, you know, they wear their yin and yang and their peace sign. Well, what's yin and yang mean? Well, yin and yang comes out of Eastern religion, out of Taoism, and 
Yin and Yang is teaching that there is a perpetual kind of forcing back and forth between polar opposites, black, white, light, dark, good, bad, evil, good. And this is a standard idea in a lot of Eastern thinking. So in dualism, you have the forces of good and the forces of evil, and they just kind of back and forth, back and forth, and you're hoping that the good will triumph. And when the good kind of triumphs for a while, evil comes back, but evil won't always triumph. The good will come back again, and it's just this ongoing battle. It's what you see happening in the Star Wars um, movies. All right, The force is there. There's a good side. There's a bad side. You've got to balance it. You've got to live in the, in the tension, and you've got to live in that kind of harsh truth. People say, well, that's what's going on in the Bible. Because you've got God who creates a good universe, and now the forces of evil rise up and try to pull it down, and God pushes back, and now we have this continual battle inside every human being between good and evil. Sometimes my good side comes out, sometimes my bad side comes out, and they're both going on, and it's this battle back and forth, back and forth, back and forth for all of eternity. Oh, what's good or what's wrong? is God. Why is that? Because it puts him on the same level as Satan. All right. Excellent. So one of the big problems with dualism is God becomes an equal partner with Satan. And so Satan becomes kind of the antithesis of God, which he's not. Because if he was, that would make him an equal power with God. He's not. Satan is underneath God. He is a creature. So Satan is not equal to God. He's a creature. Before God created the universe, there was no Satan. Satan does not exist from eternity. You don't have God and Satan existing from eternity, doing battle forever. And that's kind of the standard in a lot of the... Um, the um, creation myths and the mythology you run across, this kind of cosmic battle going back and forth, back and forth. No, it's just God. God creates. Satan is part of that creation. Satan falls, rejects God, and runs and, and lives in rebellion against God, but he's still a creature. So is there a pitched battle back and forth? No. God's in control. God's God. I was just, you were referring to Satan as creation, which makes sense to me. It's creature. Creature. Mm -hmm. um, so then when we, I mean, we talk about the fall of Adam and Eve as a human uh, repercussion, but if Satan was a creature, then wasn't there a repercussion to physical nature? That a fall of, I don't know, trees and mountains and... Oh, with when you Satan... You know what I mean? Because if Satan was a creature... Okay, so what, what, what effect did Satan's fall have on the rest of creation? Right. That's kind of your question. Yeah. I, that's a great question. Scripture doesn't answer it at all. It doesn't even point to that. What we get from Scripture is no discussion about this at all. What we have is God creates. Everything's great. The serpent shows up. And even the serpent isn't identified as Satan. It's just the serpent. Later on, we get the fact that you know Satan was doing this stuff through the serpent. But um, there he is. And he gets the curse. And so we, we conclude that somewhere after the creation, before the fall, Satan also had rebelled. And apparently, his rebellion had not adversely affected all of creation in the same way that Adam's sin had, because Adam was part of this world. And see, that's kind of what C.S. Lewis plays with when he's even doing his space trilogy. Only Earth has fallen, not everything. And so Earth is in a, in a state of brokenness, and everything else is functioning with God as it was intended. That's all. I mean, like I said, speculation as well. But we are not told what effect, if any, Satan's fall had on the rest of creation. Good, good question, though. Well, we know that God's angels are pitted against Satan's angels, too, right? like Daniel and things like right. that. So, yes. But they are part of creation. So it's not, sure. It's not Satan battling God. It's Satan battling God's angels. Yeah. I mean, see, and even that is, you know, yeah. So you've got the, the, the angels, God's creatures, you know, good, good servants who are battling against Satan's hordes, you know, the, all the fallen angels. and But even that, you know, you have to be a little bit careful. It's not like, man, we got this big battle going on. we got to see who's going to win any given day. It's, God's in control. It's happening the way God wants it to. And even those battles are all part of the plan. And 
plays out the way God wants it to play out. He's in control. Luther liked to say that Satan was um, God's devil. So God's in control. He's God's devil. He uses him for his purposes. Satan's not in control. God is. And it's a good, healthy reminder, which creates other problems for us, but we'll save those for tomorrow. Okay? <laughs> All right. What's that? Yeah, no, of course you can. All right, so a yin and yang, kind of a Star Wars Manichaeanism.